I think it's fair to say that we've never seen a virus quite like SARS-CoV-2. The initial picture that it was a cough and fever that could potentially turn into pneumonia three months later now seems almost quaint. But with questions remaining about the access to and reliability of testing, does what we're learning about this huge symptomatic presentation of the virus help us diagnose cases? And why is that range of symptoms so huge? Well, the Cochrane Review on Signs and Symptoms has just been released, and I've done my own study involving almost 2,000 long haulers. Let's investigate. It's only relatively recently that the broader picture of how the virus can affect people is starting to emerge. And it's not just that there's a huge range of mild symptoms, which there are, but serious ones too. Here's the BBC. Some scientists suspect that COVID-19 causes respiratory failure and death, not through damage to the lungs, but the brain, and other symptoms include headaches, strokes and seizures. Dr Julie Helms. It has been very scary, especially because many of the people we treated were very young. Now, more than 300 studies from around the world have found a prevalence of neurological abnormalities in COVID-19 patients. This is in addition to recent findings that the virus, which has been largely considered to be a respiratory disease, can also wreak havoc on the kidneys, liver, heart, and just about every organ system in the body. And so, of course, with the virus affecting people in so many ways, we're seeing a plethora of symptoms attributable to the virus. But this leads us to an important question. Could symptoms help clinicians with diagnosing COVID-19, especially when the effectiveness of some of the tests, like swabs, is limited to a short period early in the infection? Well, on the 7th of July, the Cochrane Review on signs and symptoms of COVID-19 was released to try and answer exactly that. Let's take a look. To answer the question, can symptoms and medical examination accurately diagnose COVID-19 disease, the Cochrane Review found 16 relevant studies with 7,706 participants assessing 27 separate signs and symptoms. Here it is in full. For first thing I'll just point out, look at the contents. Here are those 27 separate investigated symptoms. Look at the range of them. And this is just from the studies conducted up until April. There's a huge amount of data, so let's skip to the conclusions. First of all, they say it's hard to diagnose from any single sign or symptom. It's the combination of symptoms here which are key. Although they do identify four individual red flags which significantly increase the probability of COVID-19 when present. They are fever, myalgia or muscle aches, fatigue and headache. And it stands to reason that if you start to combo a few of those red flag symptoms together, especially in the context of high prevalence or exposure, and the statistical probability of a COVID-19 infection becomes pretty high. And what about the government's favourite swab qualifying criteria, the cough? The majority of the studies that investigated cough found that cough decreases the probability of COVID-19, despite the fact that it is part of the case definition of COVID-19 in most countries. So if you've just got a cough, don't worry too much. As for that negative correlation, the study believes it's a function of selection bias. In the strengths and weaknesses of the review, the study comments, the lack of data on combinations of signs and symptoms is an important evidence gap. Well, guess who's been busy? I conducted a symptom survey across several long haul Facebook groups in the UK, US and Sweden, as well as the Body Politic long haul group on Slack. To date, over 1800 responses. This is a huge sample size. Now, as always, some caveats. Uh, the sample is both self-selecting and self-reporting. Uh, there is no control group and the sample is also heavily gender weighted, being mostly female. Uh, this is most likely due to usage of the platforms involved and probability to take part. However, we have seen that both with chronic fatigue syndrome and ME, sufferers are more likely to be women. So there is a larger question here uh, about whether women are more likely to experience the long tail of COVID than men. Unfortunately, I can't address that here. One more caveat. I didn't ask for test results on this study, having previously collected them uh, in my antibody survey. So arguably that does leave an evidence gap here. But what I would argue is that with almost all of these long haulers uh, presenting a combination of the red flag symptoms raised in the Cochrane Review, that those symptoms alone are fairly indicative of a COVID-19 infection, as opposed to flu or some other viral infection. So let's look at the cross section of this group of long haulers. Are they old and inactive and subsequently prone to illness? Categorically not. 
You can see that there's a very even spread of ages here, from 25 to 34 up to 55 to 64. There's more 65 and over than 25 and under, but that's probably due to Gen Zs treating Facebook like the plague and spending more time on TikTok and Snapchat. Covid is definitely not just of consequence to the elderly. How active were this group before infection? 96% of them were active day to day, and two thirds of them reported multiple moderate or vigorous exercise activities every week. This was a fit bunch. And how did Covid strike first? Same way for everyone? Absolutely not. Look at this psychedelic trivial pursuit piece of a pie chart for the first symptom. Now, it's not uncommon for some varied prodromal symptoms in the early onset of a viral infection, and we do have to trust people's memories on this one too, but I bet if you asked this same question for sufferers of flu or the common cold, the pie chart wouldn't look like this. One interesting point here, the most common first symptom reported was sore throat, and at the time most of these infections occurred back in March, sore throat was ruled out as a symptom in the official communications about the virus. Personally, I was one of the 2.6% who reported nausea first here. Now let's look at those combinations of symptoms. Anecdotally, there seemed to be two versions of the COVID experience that people were getting. Some were certainly getting the classic cough, fever, potentially loss of smell and taste, whilst others, like myself, were getting something that was more like nausea, GI issues, chills, shivers, headache, fatigue. And we've also seen a distinction in the long haulers between those who are experiencing something that's much closer to classic post-viral fatigue and then others who are getting ongoing viral symptoms much closer to what they experienced in the early weeks of infection. Is there a connection between which of the first two experiences of the disease you get and then which of the second? That is to say, does the early course of the disease lead to a probability of which form of long tail symptoms you're likely to experience? Well, we'll come to that. First, let's look at those first two weeks. First observation, the second group, nausea, GI chills, were more common than the classic cough and fever, which comprised only 23% of the sample. This reflects what we've also seen in hospital studies. The classic cough and fever cases really are the minority. But most people, represented by the green area here, experience some combination of the two, elements of both or a range of other symptoms. Let's just drop through some of them. It really is a pick and mix of those 27 symptoms the Cochrane Review looked at. There is very little predictability to the course of a COVID infection in terms of its symptomatic presentation. And how about the long tail? Does that break down cleanly? Not really. Another messy bit of business. Very broadly speaking, a quarter experiencing post-viral fatigue, slightly over a quarter experiencing what feel like ongoing viral symptoms, a quarter experiencing what feels like both, and then another quarter with a huge range of symptoms. Maybe we can make some sense out of the progression though. Here's the numbers for how many of each group from the first two weeks and what version of the long tail they experienced. I had a hypothesis that the nausea GI chills version might be more likely to subsequently present as post viral fatigue rather than ongoing symptoms. Let's look at the chart. Three groups along the bottom describing people's first two weeks of the illness, classic cough fever, nausea GI chills, and other, which as a general rule included people who experienced both and other additional symptoms too. Green bar is a long tail of post-viral fatigue, red bar the ongoing viral symptoms, purple represents people who experienced both, and yellow a more complex presentation. So is my hypothesis that the nausea GI chills version is more likely to subsequently present post-viral fatigue borne out? Not really, no. The green bar of PVFS here is slightly longer than it is in the classic cough and fever group, but generally speaking, especially given the messy qualitative nature of the symptoms reporting and data here, I wouldn't want to hang my hat on it. What we can see here though is that the other category, those who felt they either experienced both sets of symptoms early on or additional ones that didn't fit, are much more likely to have complex combinations of symptoms in the long tail too. 26% of people reporting complex presentations here, compared to 12 and 10% in the other groups. So why is COVID such a slippery customer? Why is it affecting so many people in so many ways? At the peak of the outbreak in March, it was widely believed that COVID-19 was a respiratory illness, that is to say, one that affects the lungs. But as we've done more research, it's become apparent that this is just one manifestation of it. Here's Science Magazine. Many patients had acute kidney failure, organ damage, and mysterious blood clots. The results showed Rysitschka, that's University Hospital Zurich's lead cardiologist, why his patients were suffering so much. The virus had targeted their blood vessels. 
That's right, COVID-19 isn't so much a respiratory condition as a vascular one. Yes, the virus does get into the body through the respiratory passages, through the nose and into the lungs, but from there the virus gets into the blood vessels, and at that point it has free reign to go pretty much wherever the body pumps blood. Since the Zurich team's findings were published in mid-April, dozens of studies have revealed similar patterns of vascular damage in people who died of COVID-19. The lungs of COVID-19 victims had nine times as many clots as those who died of the H1N1 flu. Other studies have noted inflammatory symptoms in children and strokes in otherwise healthy young adults. The virus is infecting the endothelial cells that line the inside of the blood vessels. And this is why we're seeing things like COVID toes, where the capillaries uh, at the end of the toe get blocked. The virus affects every organ in the body that has fine blood vessels. So yes, the lungs, but also the kidney, the gut, and the brain. The virus doesn't attack the gray matter in the brain or the muscle in the heart, but it attacks the blood vessels that supply both of those organs. And along with some evidence that the virus also targets the hypothalamus, which is responsible for regulating many of the body's key processes and hormones, we can start to see how this huge range of symptoms become possible. In addition to fatigue, interrupted normal function of the hypothalamus would help explain some of the other symptoms frequently reported by long haulers, including insomnia, thirst, irregular periods, and racing heart. Right now, we're at the very early stages, not just of the pandemic, but also our understanding of the SARS-2 virus. There's a huge amount more research to be done before we have even a hope of understanding how the SARS-2 virus works and what it can do to the body. And remember that it's an RNA virus, and that means it mutates quickly, like every two weeks. How on earth do we stay on top of a virus like that? Good question, and one I'll be trying to address in my next film. Till next time.